morning. Good to see y'all this morning. If you'll stand with us, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I couldn't think of any place I'd rather be. Join with us. Come now is the time to worship. salvation and the promise 
of a home that is everlasting when we leave this life. I'm so thankful this season that we're now entering. And forgive me if I do make it personal for just a minute because I can think of a year ago this day when I was, me and Daddy had a conversation saying, she'll be home by Thanksgiving. I know it. And then Thanksgiving came and she wasn't. stop while I'm ahead, but God is good, God is good. Amen. and I'm thankful this morning because he does hear us even when some of those prayers seem to go unanswered, he still hears and he's good to us, and because of that, I feel really good this Thanksgiving season, and because of the people he's placed in my life and the, the prayers he's answered. I do feel like, I feel really good this holiday season, and I do feel like traveling on. I do know that he has a home promise for me, and after this life, and I'm excited about what lays ahead, and I know not everybody's had the turnout that we've had in this last year, and tomorrow may hold something different, but he'll be with us tomorrow, too. So just sing with us. I feel like traveling on.
myself a minute ago, um, a friend of mine at work, and we're so busy. I work with the same people every day. You just don't see some of them for weeks at a time. And she stopped me to ask how um, everything was, how her family was, and we just talked for a, a while. And um, I was talking to her about Tiffany, and um, she had a family member. It was her brother-in-law um, late earlier this year who he did not uh, live through COVID. And, um, and, you know, I felt bad talking to her about just the struggles we were having with Tiffany and knowing that she had had a family member who didn't die. And so I just backtracked and said, but we are so blessed because I know you had a family member who didn't make it. And um, we were talking about the day that was coming that we would see um, the family members who went on. And she said, you know, there is coming a day. She said, you're going to hear Tiffany speak your name. And, um, and I said, and you're going to see your brother-in-law. And she said, you know what he's going to say? I've been fine all along. And, you know, we we're just talking about when we make it, all the things we're going to see. And we talk about and even at home, um, you know, the day that I'm going to see, not just me, I'm not the only one that's going to make it, you know? We're going to see Tiffany run the streets of gold. And I'm going to be there. You know, she walks with a, a little limp sometimes. Not sometimes. She walks with a limp. But I'm going to see her walk the streets of gold and run the streets of gold without that limp. And I'm going to make it. I want to be there. And um, God has done everything to make sure that we can make it. He gave the gift of his son. And what a day going to be when we make it. And we see our loved ones who have gone on before and you know, we're going to see them again. And I look forward to that day um, and I look forward to seeing you there and them there and um, when all things that have been so difficult are passed away and we won't think of them anymore because all that will be wiped away. So sing with us what a day that will be.
Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Think about it. What a day. What a day. Tell you what, do we have a lot to be thankful for, as Molly was saying? If you have something to be thankful for, will you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'll tell you what. If you were able to walk in today, if you're able to hear me today, if you're able to see me today, if you can taste your food, if you can smell your food, if you were able to get out of bed this morning, I'll tell you what, we have something to be thankful for. How about this? If Jesus Christ lives in your heart, you have something to be thankful for. Amen. Tell you what, this world sometimes just seems to be crashing down around us. Well, I want to encourage you today. Read the book. You're going to find out that this world is destined for destruction. As a matter of fact, do you know the Bible teaches he's going to make a new heaven and a new, a new earth? A new earth. Praise God. Praise God. What a day. What a day it will be. Kelly, good to see you and Roman in the house of the Lord. Can you give the Lord a cheer? Thank God the COVID season is over for you all, right? Praise God. Praise God. Well, God bless you. You're welcome. Uh, are you still tired? Yeah. I hear it. I hear it wears you out. But we're thankful that you're here. Thankful uh, God has blessed us. Uh, aren't you thankful Babby's here playing the piano for us? Thank you, Babby. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you. God bless you. Well, uh, before I begin the message, I want to say a special thanks to a minister. You don't know him, but I want to give credit where credit is due. His name is D.C. Cooper. And uh, I want to give him credit for this, this uh, sermon topic and some of the thoughts I may share with you this morning about launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep. So let me begin this way. If we all have one desire in common as believers in Christ, it should be to be used of God for His glory. Now I want that to sink in to you a little bit. If we all have one desire in common as believers in Christ, it should be to be used of God for His glory. That should be a desire that we have in common because we believe in Christ. If that is not your heart's desire, you say, well, you know what? That's just not on my priority list. Pastor, I just don't think about that. That's just not, that's just not a concern of mine. If it's not your heart's desire to be used of God for His glory, then we need to spend some serious time in prayer, repentance, and surrender. That sounds a little hard, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Now let me back it up with the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Paul was writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing to the church of Corinth. He's writing it to them before us today. And he said, so whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, in other words, it doesn't matter what you're doing, do all to the glory of God. Somebody say amen. amen. So let me break that down just a little bit. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. That means that... Uh, what you watch on television should bring glory to God. What you listen to, the kind of music you listen to, the kind of books you read, the kind of conversations you have, the thoughts that you have, the things that you want, the relationships that you're involved in. They should all be for the glory of God. It's really that simple. Paul said, whatever you do, how about this? The way you spend your money should be for the glory of God. And, and you know, it's easy to say, now, wait a minute, Pastor, you're getting in my business. And uh, I want you to hear this this morning. No, I'm not getting in your business. God is getting in your business. Besides, you belong to Him. 
So what business do you have saying it's your business instead of God's business? That's why if we, if it's not our heart's desire that we should be used of God for his glory, we better spend some time in prayer. We better spend some time in repentance. We better spend some time in surrender because the word says whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Would you bow your heads? Jesus, I believe your word is powerful and I believe you want to speak to us. Lord, as I was preparing for this message, as you began to minister to me, Lord, I believe you did it in such a way because you knew who would be sitting right where they're sitting today. You, you knew what would be going through their minds. And so, Lord, I believe that you have something that will uh, teach us more about you and encourage us, motivate us, God, to do these things. Would you use me for your glory, Jesus, because you love us? We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Now, I, I acknowledge that sometimes being used of God for his glory seems out of reach for us. We feel like, well, I'm, I'm not qualified. Well, what can I do? How, how can I be used for God's glory? You might say, uh, Crystal, you might say, I just work at Walmart. How can I be used of God for his glory in Walmart? Sue, there's a lot of strange people coming in and out of Walmart. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, if you're in Walmart, you can let your light shine. <laughs> you can let your light, you can let your light shine. We, sometimes we feel like we're just not qualified. What can I do? We don't have enough Bible knowledge. We don't have enough spiritual maturity. Uh, we think there's nothing meaningful or significant we can do for God. Sometimes that's the thought the enemy puts in our mind, that we can't do anything meaningful or significant for God. Well, let me ask you this. Isn't it meaningful? And significant to help point someone to Jesus? Yes. yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we can do that by living a life of example. We can do that so that we live our lives in such a way so that people come to us and they say, what is it that enables you to do this? All this chaos going on around us. Anybody have any chaos at the job? Anybody? You know, I'm a pastor. I guess we don't have any chaos in our jobs. One day a week. <laughs> yeah, one day a week. <laughs> yeah, we all have some chaos in our job. But if you have things just seem to be running out of control at your job, but yet, yet you seem peaceful. You know, we need, to, we need to have such a peace about us, such a presence of Christ about us, that people say, what, what is it? How, how, do you, how do you do that? How, how did you not respond in anger and violence when this person approached you? How, how did you do that? How, how is it you've, had, you've lost someone in your family, but yet you still believe in Jesus? You know, we need to live a life in such a way that, that people are coming to us and seeking some answers, and we can point them to Jesus. Now, that is meaningful, and that is significant. So, what kind of people does God use? I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about what kind of people God uses, and I think you'll find in these descriptions, it's people just like the person you're sitting next to. Well, you're not sitting next to anybody, are you? <laughs> Crystal said it might be us. <laughs> That's right, we might have to look in the mirror. Well, here's the thing. If Randy thinks I'm talking about his mother and his mother thinks I'm talking about him, then we're really talking about each other. Talking about each other. What kind of people does God use? Well, if there ever was a person that was surprised that God not only called him to his service, but used him in a powerful way, you may remember this first century fisherman from Galilee known as Simon Peter. Anybody heard of Simon Peter? He was introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew. When Jesus met him, he changed his name from Simon to Peter. Why? Because the name Simon means a reed. In other words, here was a man that was blown by the winds of public opinion and shaken in his belief by the presence of others. Sometimes we're that way. Depending on what everybody, what, what everybody says, we tend to lean this way. You ever seen somebody like that? Like a chameleon. They change whatever, whatever's popular, that's the way they go. They have no, no convictions. It's just, it's a, what's, let's see, what's the theological term? I think the theological term is wishy-washy. <laughs> you ever seen a person like that? Well, Simon, his name meant a reed, but Jesus saw something more in Simon. 
So he called him Peter, meaning a rock, one who would be strong and steadfast in his loyalty. So that was the transformation of Peter from a reed to a rock. You may remember that his encounter began by the Sea of Galilee. He was in the fishing business with his brother Andrew. They were partners with their close friends, James and John. And on the day we're going to hear about in, this, in our passage today, these fishermen had just fit, uh, spent a tough night fishing, yet they failed to catch anything. Anybody ever been fishing and you didn't catch anything? Did you enjoy it, Haley? No. You know, some people love it. They can fish, they, the one they call it fishing, but they come home with nothing. Now, <laughs> now I'm not much of a fisherman, Ray, but I thought the point was to catch what? Fish. Fish. That's why they don't call it catching, Kelly. <laughs> Good point. They don't call it catching. They call it fishing. They call it fishing. Well, they had fished all night. Some of you know that song. Peter, James, and John and Sailboat. Peter, James, and John and Sailboat. Peter, James, and John and Sailboat. Out of the deep blue sea. Anybody know the next verse? They fished all night, but they caught no fish. Fished all night, but they caught no fish. Fished all night, but they caught no fish. Out on the deep blue sea, long came Jesus walking on the seashore. Long came Jesus walking on the seashore. Long came Jesus walking on the seashore. You know where it was? Out on the deep blue sea. <laughs> he said, cast your nets. Some of you know that song. We used to sing that song. Well, that's what happened. They fished all night. They hadn't caught anything. They were tired. They were frustrated. And around the shoreline, a crowd had gathered. And this new controversial teacher, some said he was a Messiah, he was preaching, and Simon was listening from a distance. And after teaching the crowd, Jesus noticed Simon and his companions along with their boats on the shoreline, and he asked to use Peter's boat so he could address the people offshore. So after preaching to Peter, he made an unusual request. We're going to see this in a minute in the scripture. He said, launch out into the deep. That's what I want to focus on today, launch out into the deep. Our text is going to be from Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. It begins like this. Verse 1 and 2. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him, speaking of Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. Anybody know why they were washing their nets? They were done fishing, hadn't caught any fish. They were done for the day. Verse 3. Then he, this is talking about Jesus. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little for the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Jesus is telling them to do something that doesn't seem to make much sense. Because they had fished all night, and they caught what? They didn't catch anything. But Jesus, when he finished, he said, go out to the deep, put your nets down. Those nets you just cleaned, that were empty, let them down. Verse 5. But Simon answered him, this is a great verse, and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night, and what did they catch? Nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, in verse 6, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Where did the fish come from? They fished all night, had caught any fish. Verse 7, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. So they went from nothing to a whole lot. Now, would that surprise you? That would surprise me. It surprised Simon. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Verse 9 and 10, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, instead of being a fisherman, <laughs> instead of fishing, Kelly, he said, you're going to catch. <laughs> you're going to catch. 
Don't be afraid, for now and you're going to catch men. Verse 11. So when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. We talked the last couple of weeks about following, going along with Jesus. So Jesus challenges you and me. He challenges this local church family to launch out into the deep. I hear in my spirit, the Lord is saying to us, let your nets down. There's a harvest. Get ready to collect. And maybe the enemy is going to stir in your mind. Oh, wait a minute. It just doesn't seem like it's, I mean, you know, we're still in a pandemic. We've got all these things going on. Uh, some people left and will never come back. Who knows what's going to happen next? We fished all night, but we caught no fish. And I hear the Spirit of God saying, launch out into the deep. So, let's get back to what kind of people does God use to launch out into the deep? Well, first, God uses ordinary people. Look at somebody and say, you're ordinary. You're ordinary. <laughs> they might get upset at you. They might say, well, wait a minute, I think I'm special. Well, maybe you're special or ordinary, I don't know. <laughs> but God uses ordinary people. Peter was a fisherman, a common man. And this was one of the things that was unique about Jesus as a rabbi, because Traditionally, parents would save up enough money and then they'd seek out a rabbi to teach their son when they wanted to study the law of God. But not so with Jesus. He sought out his followers and he was no respecter of persons. In fact, to the Pharisees, he said, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. These people who thought they were so righteous, he said, these people who have repented are coming in before you. God uses ordinary people. What kind of people does God use to launch out into the deep? He uses ordinary people. He also uses persevering people. In other words, keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Look at your neighbor and say, don't give up. This isn't the time to give up. Perseverance is a greater resource than ability. Now I'm going to speak for just a moment as a pastor. I would rather have a group full of people that keep on keeping on than some people who think they can do it all. They have this, and maybe they can do. They have a lot of abilities, but they really don't want to try. They try once, they fished all night, caught no fish, they're going on. I'd rather have people that say, we're going to keep on. We're going to keep at it. We're going to keep at it. They had fished all night, they caught nothing. The effort failed, but Peter was willing to go back and try again. Don't give up. Keep on sharing and spreading the good news of Jesus and then trust God to send someone to water and then watch him give the increase. Persevering people. God has laid that on my heart. Okay, Les, get ready. It's time to step out in faith and say, you know what? Uh, it seems like there's not a lot of fruit. We fished all night, but we caught no fish. And I hear the Spirit of God saying, let down your nets. And when, when, when they start getting full, you start saying, Melanie, let down your, let your net. Ron, let down your net. Come on. Let, let's trust God. Let's trust God to multiply us. God uses ordinary people to launch out to the deep. He uses persevering people. And he also uses people who will trust and obey. Because one of the greatest faith statements in the Bible is found in this beautiful passage. Look at that verse in Luke 5, 5 again. Where he said, nevertheless, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. If there's one word we need to put in our vocabulary, put this word, nevertheless. It means in spite of, in spite of doubt, in spite of discouragement, in spite of disillusionment, in spite of failures of others, in spite of personal setbacks, in spite of my own personal failure, I'm going to let down the net. I'm going to let down the net. Because Jesus gave a command when he left. He was getting ready to leave this world. When he left this world, he gave a commission to his followers, and we are his followers, and he said, go. 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 And you say, well, I'm too old to go. Jesus didn't say, stop. <laughs> Do what you can. Do what you can. Maybe you can't go like you used to go. Maybe you can't do like you used to do. But God can lay something on your heart that you can do. Do you know what it means to someone to get a call just out of nowhere? They're not expecting a call, and you call them, and they answer, and a 
just wanted to call and tell you I love you. I'm praying for you. I'll tell you what. You do that at the right time, in the right place, in the right way, you can really make a difference in somebody's life. God help us. God help us. God helps and uses people who trust and obey. We need to trust God because he is faithful. Can you say amen? What kind of people does God use to launch out to the deep? Ordinary people, persevering people, people who trust and obey. And God also uses humble people. <laughs> Humility simply means to recognize your need of God. Look at what Peter said in verse 8. When he saw this great miracle, Jesus said, let down your nets and they began to feel this, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. In other words, he began to worship God. Worship is when you realize who you are and who he is. And that, that recognition produces worship. So, so uh, modern world, we need to get off our high horse. We need to think, we, we need, we need quit thinking we know more than this book. We, we, we need to quit thinking we know better than what this book says. We need to quit think, thinking we know better than God. We need to realize he's God and we are not. Because I, I suggest to you, the way we live is God said it, that settles it. Believe it or not, God said it, that's the end of the story. God said it and that settles it. So we need to humble ourselves before God. Humility is a mark of all God's servant. Look at the book. Abraham said, I'm nothing but dust and ashes. Jacob said, I'm less than the least of all your mercies. Job said, I repent and abhor myself. Isaiah said, woe is me. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners and the least of all the apostles. So the examples we have in the Bible of faithful men and women of God, they didn't lift themselves up, but they humbled themselves before God and before others. Here's what D.C. Cooper says about this. He says, humility before God transforms us into servants for uh, to others. That's our role. You want to win people? Serve them. Serve them. Serve them. What can we do to make a difference in this community? That's one of the things I share with you as my vision for this church, to be a church that makes a difference in our community. What can we do to make a difference in our community? Serve the community. Find out where there is a need in the community and let's, let's serve it. Like we did recently with the Thanksgiving meals. Thanks to your generosity, we had 10. We had people bring bags with uh, the ingredients for our Thanksgiving meal for 10 different families. And then the church put in, uh, thanks to some contributions, the church put in uh, $16 per meal to buy a turkey. That was $160. So we were able to help the local rescue mission to provide 10 Thanksgiving families, Thanksgivings for families. <laughs> That's a way we can serve our community. Humility before God transforms us into service to others, Cooper said. We relinquish our desire to rule over others. We relinquish our desire to control, to dominate, to intimidate, and to exercise authority. You want to win people? You need to come and get in their level. I remember uh, I had just begun pastoring here. I hadn't been here for just a few months. <clears throat> and my son came to visit me. And uh, Adam has been involved in all kinds of different sizes of churches, some very large churches, some smaller churches, different denominations, different structures, you know. And Adam said to me, he said, Dad, you have an incarnate style of leadership. And uh, Scott, I said, is that good or bad? <laughs> I said, I, I had never heard that term. What, what does that mean? He said, well, you know, it's in, incarnate, you know, it's like Jesus incarnate. In, in other words, in the flesh. He said, in other words, he said, you don't see yourself as someone above everybody else. He said, you see yourself as one of the people and, 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 and you know, you're serving the people. And I said, well, Adam, I didn't know there was a name for that. <laughs> I just thought that's the way you were supposed to be. Because Jesus came to serve and we're supposed to serve. God uses ordinary, persevering people, people who trust and obey, humble people. And what kind of people does God use to launch out to the deep? He also uses visionary people. Christ gives Peter a vision of what he can be and what he can do. He said, don't be afraid. You're going to catch men from now on. He helped Peter understand you're going to go from this reed, something that blows here and there to a, a rock. We need vision. 
These people left everything. That doesn't mean that they left their families. They did not. In fact, they traveled with Jesus and returned home to raise their families. That's what they did. But they did walk away from their business. In fact, they followed him. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another thing that happened when I, when I accepted the call to go into ministry full-time and come to Eden. <clears throat> I had several people, and they were ministers. And Mary Jo, they said, uh, so, so what are you, you going to do? Are you going to keep your job and keep your house and you know, just go back and forth and see how it works? I said, no. I said, we're selling our house. I'm quitting my job. We're moving to Eden to pastor. And uh, I had a minister friend of mine said, I didn't think people did that anymore. And I said, well, I thought that's what you were supposed to do. <laughs> and I said, you know what? When, when you feel like God has called you to do something, when you have a vision that this is why you're here. I know Brother, Brother Russell asked me once. He said, uh, Brother Les. Actually, he probably said, Brother Les, Brother Les. <laughs> he said, uh, do you still feel like you're where God wants you? Yes, sir, I do. I feel like this is where God wants me. And I said, that's what helps you get through the tough times. Pray for Brother Russell, by the way. I talked to him just the other day. And I said, how are you feeling? He said, if I said I was feeling fine, that would be stretching the truth. He said, I got a nerve problem in one of my legs. It goes down my leg. He said, it doesn't hurt me all the time, but when it hurts me, it hurts me. I said, well, Brother Russell, you're attached to that leg, aren't you? He said, yes, and I want to stay that way. <laughs> so just pray for Brother Russell. He would appreciate it. So God uses people that have a vision. In other words, people that God, his spirit, can work through and say, I want to do something. And I'm excited because I feel like that God is just putting that into my spirit. I don't know what he wants to do, but he wants to do something. And, and he's not going to do it with just me. It's going to take you too. And you may say, well, what, what, can, what can I do? Well, let me ask you a question. Are you an ordinary person? <laughs> That's the kind of people God uses. Uh, can you persevere? Can you keep on going even when it, you feel like giving up? Can you trust God and obey his word? Can you humble yourself? And can you allow God to impress upon you a vision to see what God wants to do? See, I believe God is stirring something up. I don't know what it is. I don't know what he has planned. But when he, when he stirs, you know, he's got us in a pot. <laughs> and he's stirring us up. And when he begins to pour, which wherever he wants to pour, I want to be poured out. When he says, go do this, I want to do that. And I don't want to do it alone. I can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. I need your help. I need your help. Can you hear Jesus calling us today? Launch out into the deep. Our response may be, but I don't see anything happening. That's what happened in this passage. We fished all night, but we caught no fish. There aren't any fish there. I think that's probably what was in their mind. There, Lord, there aren't any fish here. And I believe with all my heart, there may be some people, I shouldn't say that, I should say it definitely. I believe there are people sitting here today say, okay, pastor, I hear you, but come on now, you know, we've tried, we've tried, and this is just, this is just how it is. You know, fished all night, but we caught no fish. But you, you catch what Peter said when the Lord said, launch out to the deep? He said, we, we didn't catch anything. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'm going to do it. Well, God has a word for us Amen. that it's launched out into the deep. Would you stand? I encourage you, let's trust him to use us. Let's trust him to use us. Would you bow your heads, Father? I really don't know what it is that you are planning for us. But I sense so strongly in my spirit that you are, you've got something cooking. I want to be part of it, Jesus. Lord, I think there are so many of us that are desperate to see the power of God move among us. To see miracles, anointing, gifts of the Spirit, inspiration, and love just, just flow through us. There are, there are many of us that, that long to see people that we love come to you. There are many of us who long to see uh, this church be filled with people that we don't know. Just people that come and they seek you. God, we want this church to be a soul-saving station. 
Lord, we want this church to be a place where people can come and find you. And Lord, we want this church to be full of people that realize that what it means to be the church is that we gather to worship and then we leave to serve. Lord, I believe that as we uh, begin to get into a new year, that you're going to open our eyes to opportunities to serve you. Lord, there are needs in our community. I believe the enemy has us so distracted and so focused on, on, our, on our own lives, on everything going on around us. If we're not careful, we're going to find out that we've excluded you. We don't have time to be in the Word. We don't have time to be in prayer. We don't have time to gather together. We don't have time to, to go out and serve on your behalf. Lord, if that's the case, then I believe you're going to help us to understand that there may be some things we have to cut out of our life. Because if we're too busy for you, we're too busy. Lord, if that's the case, we need to spend time in prayer. We need to repent. We need to surrender. Oh, God, I want to do that. I don't want to be so focused on everything else that I lose my focus on you. That's just a, a cheap trick of the enemy. He's a liar and a deceiver. He's the father of lies. He is a defeated foe. I proclaim you as greater. You're greater, Lord. Your power in us is greater than anything that stands in our way. So, Lord, it's easy for us right now, this Sunday morning, to look at empty seats in this pew and say, well, Lord, if it's like there just aren't, aren't, any, aren't any fish to bring in. Uh, Lord, we, we, we fished, but we hadn't caught. Lord, help us to hear the Spirit say, launch him out into the deep. Go, go, my people, go, go. I'll lead you. Lord, the key word to discipleship is to follow and walk alongside you. And, and Lord, I, I believe that you're, that you're there spiritually. You're saying, come on, come on. Help us not to drift, Master. Help us to follow Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I believe that you will confirm your word. I believe that you will do through your word exactly what you want to accomplish. I believe you will speak to the right heart at the right time in the right way. Lord, I just thank you. Lord, here's what I believe. I believe that as we get into this new year, that you're going to inspire people in this church family. And they're going to come to me and they're going to say, Pastor, I have an idea about how we can serve. And I'm going to say, let's do it. Let's do it together. I see great things for God's people as we surrender to you, Jesus. I know you'll forgive us for where we have strayed from our focus. I know you will. You're faithful and just to forgive us, Master, of everything. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for our time of worship, Lord. As we leave this place and we worship you in giving, we trust you to bless the gifts that present to you, Master. We only have them because of you. Love on us, I pray, O oh God. Love through us. I pray for those who aren't able to be here today. I pray for Charlotte and Marlowe who are sick today. Would you touch them, Jesus? I pray for James McCaslin. Uh, Lord, please give him strength. I know he's weak. He needs your strength, Jesus. Touch Bobby Turner today, Master. I pray that you touch Billy Harris, Mary Harris. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for Sadie Duncan and Jimmy Duncan. I thank you that I was able to be with her yesterday as she's walking up and down the street in the parking lot of the church near their home. And, um, Lord, she was encouraged and Jimmy was encouraged. I thank you, Lord, that the other day you visited their home in a special way as they had their own prayer meeting and the Spirit of God came down and blessed them. Thank you for touching Jimmy's body and Sadie's body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Touch Norma Howerson today. I pray, Jesus, oh God, you are great, greatly to be praised. Bless us, God. Some may be traveling today. I pray that you keep them safe, Jesus. Oh God, make us a blessing. Some will listen to this message later. Um, they'll, they'll watch the worship. They'll listen to the word. They'll hear the prayer. Would you bless them also, Jesus? And Lord, I just pray that you do all these things because of who you are, because you love us. And we'll say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Let the church say amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Be blessed in Jesus' name.